Okay, so just starting off where we finished last time, looking at some of the weaknesses of the Bohr's model. So it actually hasn't really fixed the biggest problem with Rutherford's, right? The electron is still in an orbit. Biggest problem being that an accelerating charge will radiate EMR and therefore lose energy, right? And therefore its speed will drop and it will, and therefore lose energy, right? And therefore kind of spiral in towards the nucleus and all matter will collapse, which of course cannot be true because I'm here talking to you about this. And so what Bohr had said was that, well, when it's at these stable kind of energy levels that I'm quantizing it to, it just doesn't emit EMR, right? But A, it didn't explain why they didn't emit EMR when they were at, at those stable energy levels. It also just didn't explain why they were quantized to those discrete energy levels. It worked, it explained the spectrum of hydrogen, well, it worked for hydrogen, okay? which leads to the next thing. It only works for hydrogen. The math only really works for hydrogen. It doesn't explain why some spectral lines are brighter than others. So for example, you may have even noticed when you're seeing them yesterday, some of them were really stuck out in the hydrogen emission spectrum. Some of them were like very bright, vibrant lines, whereas others are a little bit weaker, less intense. And it doesn't explain the fine line structure of the spectrum. What essentially that means is that under a magnetic field or if you zoom in far enough, essentially, that even the lines of the emission spectrum at that one very specific wavelength can kind of have little side lines off to the side. It, it can kind of be made up of even smaller divisions of, of wavelengths. Just again, a summary here. Why is it quantized? Why are the energy levels where they are? Why can you never find them in between those energy levels, right? Again, why don't they emit EMR? When they're at those levels? Why are they split in a magnetic field? And again, maybe the biggest one, it only works for hydrogen, the simplest atom. So a reminder of Louis de Broglie, right? What did he give us? He gave us matter waves or the fact that since waves like light can act like particles, well, then that's already a particle acting like a wave. And therefore, maybe things that we usually just think of as particles are also acting as waves, right? So he said, well, if there's electrons in an atom and electrons can act as a wave, why can't they act as a wave in the atom? Just a reminder of the math here, right? All it is is taking the two expressions we have for momentum, setting them equal to each other, or substituting this one in here, you can think of it as, right? And getting the de Broglie wavelength, we call it. So recall that, right? The idea of the wavelength of a particle, such as an electron. And also, you're going to have to think back to physics 20, okay? So the idea of standing waves. So remember, we would stand up at the front of the room, right? And if we could generate a wave with just the right wavelength on some fixed length of, well, we used springs, but if we found just the right wavelength, well then by the time one wave got to the end and was starting to come back, the next wave it was meeting, which I had already sent out, it would be meeting it at the right place where there was a crest or a trough, and it would constructively interfere to produce a stable standing wave. And so that just comes down to a relationship between the length of the rope and the length of the wave you're generating. However, if you're not, then crest might be trough or somewhere in between. You might not get pure destructive interference, but you're kind of going to get chaos. You're going to get garbage. You're not going to get a stable, self-sustaining standing wave. What we mean by self-sustaining is you can kind of let that go for a bit, and the standing wave will continue to hum. It's kind of the idea behind how a guitar string works. If you pluck it, there's a standing wave produced, and it hums out at that constant frequency. You don't get chaos or garbage. So it is related collectively to the waves. Crest meets crest trough meets trough, you get a nice stable standing wave. But if it's not correctly related to the wavelength, then you get random destructive interference and there will be no stable standing wave produced. So I'll just show you a quick kind of video demonstration of standing waves so you can get a feel for those again. And the key takeaway is just to realize that the length of the material through which the wave is propagating and the length of the wave itself have to have the right relationship to produce these stable standing waves. Now, if I set it to just uh, any old frequency, let me, well, so it's sending waves back and forth, but these waves are out of sync, if you like. They're, they're not exhibiting con consistently constructive or destructive interference at any one point. But if I set it here, for example, I have what's called a standing wave. That is, the wave that's, that's sent down and reflects constructively interferes with the next wave that comes down right at this point. And there we go. That's the sixth harmonic. Beautiful. Okay. So. If electrons can behave as waves, and they do, as we've seen in the crystal diffraction, right? 
where they interfere with themselves. Well, then the principles of interference obviously apply there, but also how they relate to the production of standing waves applies to them, right? Because an orbit has a size, right? It has a circumference. And so depending on how many wavelengths fit into that circumference, you might be able to get a stable standing wave, right? And that's essentially what we talk about here. So if the circumference of a Bohr orbit or energy level was the same size as a whole number of the electron's wavelength. So in other words, one full wavelength, or if an orbit is two full wavelengths or an orbit of three full wavelengths, then one wavelength would be ending exactly where the next one began. And therefore waves would be perfectly in phase. Constructive interference would occur, resulting in a stable self-sustaining standing wave. So essentially that electron behaving as a wave would constructively interfere with itself and be stable at that exact size of an orbit. Of course, though, if the circumference of a Bohr orbit was different than an integer number of wavelengths, then destructive interference occurs and you get no stable standing wave. So looking here, right, you get constructive interference, a standing wave, destructive interference. Why? Well, look, if we count out the wavelengths, let's start here. We've got one, two, three, four, five, an integer number. Right. And so as so you can think of this, OK, what about when this wave continues to go? Well, no worries. It's going to continue to go exactly in phase. So crest will meet crest, trough will meet trough, crest will meet crest, trough will meet trough. Right. However, for this one, where an integer number of wavelengths does not fully fit in and where it ends is not where the last one began. Well, if we continue to extend this wave, notice what's happening. We have trough meeting crest and crest meeting trough. Uh oh, destructive interference no stable standing wave is produced. Whereas here, constructive interference always, and you get a stable, self-sustaining standing wave. So I'll show you on this simulation here, okay? I have basically an electron, and what that blue line is representing is the de Broglie wavelength it would have at a given orbital because of the speed it would have at that orbital, right? So if I put it to one exact Bohr orbit, it draws in the wavelength and notice, okay, pretty well, it meets up exactly where it started. If I go at half an orbit though, right, that does not happen. You do not get that nice in phase thing where the wave always looks the exact same where it's kind of meeting back up with itself. I can take it out, right? And I can go to between one and two. And again, it does not meet up nicely with itself. But what if I go right to two? And there we go. It always looks the exact same again. Keep going, three right? There we get that nice meets back up with itself. If I go between two and three, it does not do that. Its crest is not meeting up with its own crest, right? And you can see kind of how the shape changes, but notice that it's always an integer number of wavelengths. So I'll let it go there. How many wavelengths fit in? Well, one, two, three, four, five, an integer number. If I go back to n equals four here, how many wavelengths? One, two, three, four. Ha, ah, what about n equals three? One, two, three. Oh, two, one, two, right? And at one, that wavelength just becomes kind of a circle. So we're bending this wave into a circular path, right? I bet you can guess how many wavelengths are gonna fit into the sixth orbit. One, two, three, four, five, six, right? Stable. Between five and six, unstable because it does not meet up right where it left off. So its own crests will not be meeting up with its own crests. Okay, so this is what the first, second, and third energy levels look like. We saw that there, right? We have one lambda, two lambda, three lambda in the third energy level, one lambda, two lambda in the second, and one lambda in the first. What about what happens between the second and the third like it asks us to do at the top there? So between the second and third, we would essentially draw two and a half wavelengths. Now note that the wavelength is slightly changing as we go because the speed of the electron is changing, which affects the de Broglie wavelength, right? But still, one, two, and a half, right? Doesn't work out. We have a crest meeting a, well, not quite a trough, but a not crest, right? And then as that continues, they don't quite constructively interfere anymore. So this is very, like I said, it's elegant, it's beautiful. It's very cool, it's such a nice kind of simple explanation that seemed to be right under our noses this whole time. But it's nothing if it doesn't agree with our observations. 
but it's very easy to check if it does. So ask ourselves, does an integer number of wavelengths fit into the circumference of the orbits for hydrogen that we've already determined? We already know them experimentally, right? In other words, two pi r, the circumference, does it equal an integer number of wavelengths? And if it does, then it seems like De Broglie has really onto something here. So the energy for each level could be determined experimentally from our spectra analysis, right? So look at the photons emitted and we know the energy difference between levels. R had been determined by Bohr for each level through the relationship that we kind of hand waved over, kind of beyond physics 30. But the ideas are not beyond physics 30. It's just the relationship to potential and kinetic energy. We have the total energy from the emission, right? So we can figure out the kinetic and potential, and then we can figure out the radius because EK is determined by V, which is determined by R. So we know R, we know EK, and we know the V that an electron should have. So with the V that an electron should have, we can plug it into here and see if that lambda ends up giving us two pi times the R that we had determined for the radius at which the electron orbits the nucleus, and also known as the Bohr radius, okay? So we checked that and guess what? It did perfectly, okay? So for hydrogen, when we figured out the V, plug that in to find the de Broglie wavelength, an integer number of the de Broglie wavelengths always fit perfectly into the circumference of that orbit, which was just two pi r, okay? So it agreed with Bohr's model and even his equations very, very well. In fact, it actually essentially says the same thing. When you look at the math, you say, huh, that's actually exactly what De Broglie was saying. He just didn't realize he was talking about wavelengths fitting into a circular orbit. But the ideas are all there in Bohr's math. It just looks a bit different. He hadn't thought about it in this way of standing waves in an orbit. Can you blame him? It's a weird idea, right? So essentially you see here, right? When n equals one, you can fit one full wavelength. When n equals two, you can fit two full wavelengths. When n equals three, you can fit three full wavelengths. De Broglie suggested that his matter waves would have a wavelength inversely proportional to the electron's momentum, which could be calculated by multiplying the mass of the electron by its velocity. De Broglie showed that by using his matter waves, he could predict each allowable orbit and its radius for the hydrogen atom. He also came up with the same energy levels as those predicted by the Bohr model. De Broglie proposed that in the ground state or first energy level, the circumference of the electron orbit is one De Broglie wavelength. This single wavelength fits around the atom's nucleus at a distance that allows the wave to interfere with itself and form a stationary or standing matter wave. In the second orbit, n equals two, two de Broglie wavelengths fit about the nucleus at a distance which once again produces a standing matter wave. This wave mechanical concept resulted in a new vision of the atom, which replaced Bohr's. I love this de Broglie model of the atom. I honestly, I would get a tattoo of it, I think. Maybe one day. Just a quick note, some of you might be kind of recalling, well, hang on, in physics 20, when we did standing waves on a string, it had to be fit an integer multiple of half wavelengths, not full wavelengths. You're right, but remember on the string, it was fixed on both ends, so that wave came back and reflected backwards. It also got inverted upon reflection, so a crest became a trough on its way back. That works out so that you have to fit half wavelengths instead of, it's just meeting back up with itself here, right? It's beating back up with the beginning of itself here, whereas when we were looking at it on a string, it was getting inverted and then coming back. And essentially what it does is, what that reflection essentially does is fold the wavelength on top of itself so that constructive interference happens every half wavelength. Here, you just need integer multiples of the wavelength. But there's the exact same principle, it's just the fact that we're dealing with, it, dealing with it now on a circle where it has to meet itself back at the beginning instead of on a reflection where it meets itself halfway through its path there and back. Okay, so. Which energy level is this electron in? We'll call that A. So in the first energy level, one full wavelength fits. In the second, two, in the third, three, so on and so forth. Remember, these de Broglie wavelengths that were calculated based on the speed of the electron, which itself was calculated based on the energy that we knew it had, were agreeing perfectly with the radius that we had calculated based on its speed, based on its energy, right? I know that's a lot of based ons, but remember, from circular motion in physics 20, 
there's an orbital speed, we call it, right? Where at a given radius, there's a speed you must have to stay in orbit. It's the same idea. So we took that energy, which was again, empirically devised from observations, from experiments. We could use that to find V, which told us R, right? And we could also use that V to find lambda and that lambda always fit an integer number of times into the orbit. Really quite a great solution. It's one of those things that just makes you go, wow, this complex idea ended up having such a simple, beautiful solution. Okay, so which energy level is this electron in? Just comes down to how many wavelengths fit, right? So I'll count it trough to trough. Start there, we got one, two, three, four, five. Okay, that was easy, just counting. B, calculate the wavelength of the electron in this energy level where the radius is 1.9 times 10 to the negative nine meters. So it fits in, we have constructive interference, right? That's kind of clearly the point here. So what do we know? Well, in this circumference, circumference is two pi r, that is on the back of your formula sheet if you don't know that one from math class, okay? And it equals an integer number of wavelengths which we know the integer is five, right? It fits five wavelengths. So solve for lambda, and we have that, and sub in. Whoops, I can't count. You've probably been screaming at me this whole time, sorry. Okay, it should be one lambda, two lambdas, three lambdas, four lambdas, five lambdas, and then to get back to where we started, six lambdas. Sorry, over six. Okay, I got 1.99 times 10 to the negative nine meters. Okay, so let's try this one on your own, pause the video and then come back and see what I did, but I'll go ahead and solve it now. So the de Broglie wavelength for an electron in the second energy level, so second energy level, that's N equals two, right? Not the second excited state, of a hydrogen atom with a radius of 2.12 times 10 to the negative 10 meters and an energy of 3.4 electron volt is blah, blah, blah. Okay, now do we necessarily need that energy? What's the de Broglie condition for a stable electron orbit. It's just that an integer number of wavelengths fit into the circumference, right? So that as a mathematical statement is two pi r, the circumference equals an integer number of wavelengths and lambda where n's an integer, okay? Nothing about energy there. So I'll note that this is not on your formula sheet, okay? So this is something you need to understand and kind of be able to pull out of where it comes from. I mean, I guess, or memorize, but it's a lot easier to understand where it comes from, right? So again, this just becomes exactly like the last question if we do it this way. Except for the fact that we now actually have to figure out that, except for the fact that now we kind of have to know that N equals two means two wavelengths fit. So you could draw it out. I find these incredibly hard to draw every time I try to draw them to show people how cool they are. I butcher it, but one, two, hey, not bad, not bad. Okay, two wavelengths fit in. So we are at N equals two. So check what, that what we're saying here makes sense, right? We're, we're saying that the half of the circumference, right? The circumference divided by two should be the wavelength. Yeah, that's exactly what we interpret this as, right? So that makes sense. And I got 6.66 times 10 to the negative 10 meters. Okay, so again, just by understanding the idea that an integer number of wavelengths must fit in. So you're probably, if you're anything like me, seeing this and thinking, wow, this is incredible. This is such a nice solution but it wasn't quite complete this was the first step down the path of solving some major problems and you can kind of see why right so now it made a lot more sense why energy was quantized into discrete levels and electrons would never be seen to have an amount of energy between any of these two levels right because you won't get a standing wave you won't get a stable wave meeting back up with itself to have crest meet crest and trough meet trough another big thing it fixes here is kind of the biggest issue of all, right? Accelerating charged particles emit EMR. But the electron's not acting like a particle here. It's behaving as a standing wave and not a charged particle. And so perhaps this is not an issue. That is why it doesn't radiate EMR, it's a wave. So the de Broglie is really the basis of where we're going. With a little tweaking, a little more rigorous quantum look at it, we get to what is to what is called the quantum model or sometimes the wave mechanical model or sometimes the electron cloud model. Really quick, recall from chapter 14, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, which is basically that it is impossible to know with absolute certainty either the position or the momentum of a wave-like system. Wave-like system, hey, that's an electron in this case, right? Again, not saying that we need a really good tool if we're ever going to figure it out. No, it is fundamentally a limit on our universe. As far as we know, 
unless something radically changes in our understanding of how our universe works that hasn't changed in the last hundred years and has only gotten more and more evidence for it, okay, there is a fundamental limit on how well you can know the position and momentum of system like this. Further, the more defined one of those things becomes, the less defined the other becomes. So the better you know the position, the less sure you are about the momentum. And I say that as if it's less sure you are, but it's also just fundamentally the less likely it is to have a defined range of motions, okay, whether or not we're observing it. So, so if we're going to model a wave as a particle, right, we build a wave packet. How we do that is constructively and destructively interfere a bunch of waves with different wavelengths and therefore different momenta until they start to all add up and they cancel out down here and they cancel out and the resulting wave looks something like that, okay? Well, now you've given it a pretty definite position. However, you have no idea about its momentum because all of these waves are making it up and it therefore, what's its, what's its momentum? Because each of these waves has a different wavelength and therefore a different momentum. So you've localized it in space, ish, there's still some uncertainty, it can never 100% know because you would need an infinite number of waves, which you can't, right? Or conversely, you can just have one wave with one wavelength. Hey, you know that thing's momentum pretty well, P equals H over lambda, right? However, where is it? Is the way, is it here? Is it here? I don't know, it could be anywhere, right? It has all of these, it's completely uncertain in position, right? So that's the idea behind Heisenberg's. What's the big deal? What does Heisenberg have to do with this? Well, there's a fundamental limit on how well we can know where an electron is, okay? As it is a wave after all, right? So these clearly defined orbits of Bohr are not a proper interpretation. So it's not even just that we can't know where it is, it's that it can't just be in that certain of a position, at least in any way that's meaningful to talk about. And so that kind of invalidates Bohr's model. So what's the big deal? Well, Schrodinger, whose name's come up a few times, in fact, the wave equations that we use to model particles in quantum mechanics is called a Schrodinger equation, okay? He took de Broglie's waves around the nucleus and he interpreted them mathematically. He basically came up with what we call probability distribution. And the amplitudes of the waves define the probability of finding an electron at that point. And so again, we're back to this quantum weirdness that we saw with the crystal diffraction. The electron isn't really at some position as a particle. It has a probability of being in many different positions. And so it kind of is in all of them and none of them, but also all of them. So the probability is very high of it being near the Bohr orbits. Okay, that's why we're seeing this. That's why it kind of made sense and matched our observations, but it still has some probability of being slightly off. And there we go. That explains the fine structure. Partially, there's a little bit more to it, but that partially explains the fine structure and the Zeeman effect, we call it, which is the splitting of the spectral lines into finer detailed lines, right? Because the electron has a probability of falling from a slightly higher or lower energy position. The probability of it being at the Bohr orbit energy level is very high. And so most photons do correspond to a fall from that exact energy level but there's a non-zero probability that it's a little bit above that orbit or a little bit below that orbit. And therefore it's going to emit a slightly bluer or redder photon with slightly more or less energy, right? And so when you zoom in far enough, you get these little quantum fluctuations in what energy level your electron was actually existing at. And so we still use the term orbital, okay? But whenever I teach chemistry, I kind of run into this problem of how to approach this with students that haven't taken physics 30, right? It is just a region in which an electron might be found. It has nothing to do with any kind of path that they are actually following, okay? So an orbital is a region of space, basically where there is non-zero probability of finding an electron around a nucleus. Now there are places where there's a zero probability, those aren't part of the orbital. And so for the hydrogen atom, Schrodinger basically it's a graph, right? This really is a graph or like a heat map, if you've ever seen one of those. That's a probability distribution of where you are very likely and very unlikely to find an electron in a hydrogen atom. So this is just hydrogen. How many electrons does hydrogen have? One, right? So this is all describing the position of where you might find one electron. So how do you interpret this? Well, black dots are where you are very likely to find an electron. White space is where you are very unlikely to find an electron. Remember, this is hydrogen. So this is where you are very likely or very unlikely to find its one electron. You can imagine these things get pretty complex when we start talking about things like gold with 79 electrons, right? Now, why does hydrogen have these six different pictures? Note that this is what, it, what the probability distribution looks like if 
that electron is in the first energy level. So n equals one. You get actually a pretty spherical shape. Then you get what we call a lobed shape and starts out with a spherical shape and then you get a lobed shape and then a dumbbell shape. Those are actually the names they use. Okay? And then they have names for all of them as they go up that I can't remember at the moment. But essentially, right, what you're seeing here is not thousands and thousands and thousands of electrons. You're seeing where that one electron that belongs to hydrogen is very likely to be and very unlikely to be. So think of this if like I gave you a map of the school and I said, okay, basically shade in darker where you think Mr. Maxwell is the most likely to be right now, right? And so you would probably put my room, you would really go over that pretty hard. There's a very good chance if you walk into the school, I'm gonna be sitting in my room, right? But maybe it's between class, I went to go grab a coffee, so you put a, so you put a little bit of shading there because there is a non-zero chance I could be there, right? So maybe I ran out to the parking lot to grab something from my vehicle, so yeah, a little bit of shading there. Again, still, I'm most likely to be in my classroom, so you're gonna shade that really dark, and chances are, if you make an observation, that's where I'll be, just like in these hydrogen probability distributions, chances are they're gonna be very near the Bohr orbit but there's a non-zero chance they won't be. Just like maybe I'm going to get a coffee, maybe I ran out to my vehicle, that's a pretty low probability, right? Maybe I'm down in the staff room, maybe I'm in Mr. Rice's room. There's about a zero probability that I'm on the roof, right? So you're gonna shade that in, if at all, and there's truly a zero probability that I would be in between walls or something. So you're not going to shade there. So there are still places where you will never find an electron. And those are represented by the white spaces here because you, like Schrodinger did with his equations that describe the existence of the electron, know that the wave function does not work out to constructively interfere there. And so sometimes you'll see why we call the quantum model the electron cloud model, okay? Because you can imagine the nucleus being surrounded by a cloud where electrons are not, but where electrons could be, right? And so I guess they are, but also aren't. In fact, they're kind of everywhere. They're kind of smeared throughout this probability. At least that's the best we can do for a physical interpretation if you must have a physical interpretation, right? Which sometimes we can't. Sometimes math really does just describe our universe and we have to accept that. So that's what's saying here, right? This really does solve the accelerating charge problem, but maybe in a bit of an unsatisfying way, depending on what satisfies you. We simply must accept that the charge and the mass of an electron exist as sort of a smear throughout this probabilistic distribution. So the electron's charge and its mass are sort of just smeared throughout these shells. And so the charge is never really accelerating. And so it's never producing EMR. It's just exists. Now you might be thinking, well, how do we get a photon then at all if it's just smeared? Well, remember, there's a different probability distribution at n equals one and n equals two. So when the smearing of the electron goes from here to here, it's almost like that smear pops in and out of existence, okay? And so the electron, and so the electron's probability distribution here has sort of an average smearing of energies to a different average smearing of energies, and a photon must be either emitted or absorbed for that to happen. So Bohr's model still works really well. This is just getting a bit more at the truth of what is going on or at least the mathematical truth of what's going on. What is the big thing on the quantum model side? It works for all atoms, everything, okay? It even explains the chemical bonds in, for the atoms in the middle of the periodic table that you might have noticed in chemistry class, we always brush over, we don't talk about them, right? It's because it's pretty complex, but it can be explained by this stuff. Can't be explained by Bohr's, which essentially is where your bonding uh, knowledge ends in High school chemistry is at Bohr's model. The quantum model can explain the ones that we kind of just say, eh, don't ask about that one, <laughs> okay? So important to know, what is this at its essence? It is a purely mathematical working model that works very well, like incredibly well. It's been said many times that quantum mechanics is the most successful theory in science. So at its core, it really is just a mathematical model. It's a heat map. It's a probability distribution. It might even be weird to say that this is an atom, but it is our model of the atom. It's held up for a hundred years now, and every, every observation we've made has further strengthened its validity for making predictions and for modeling our universe. Okay, so if you're looking for practice with this stuff, try out the topic four practice assignment in the Google Classroom or Agenda. And if you're feeling good about all this stuff for the week, you've come ask me any questions you have. 
uh, you can go ahead and try the weekly check-in. Have a great weekend.